Bueno, Dr. Marvan, first of all, my affectionately greetings to you. And as I have always told you, my admiration and gratitude because you have become a great friend to me. And you know that I am the number one fan. Learning, I know. See, learning from uh, you uh, has been a blessing because you are a great reference of the world of endodontics. Suela más, Pati. Más. Sí, suela más. Más. Thank you for your generosity, uh, for your time, and for your teachings. Okay, good morning um, for all. Dr. Marwan, uh, first of all, my uh, affectionate greetings to you. And as I have always told you, my admiration and gratitude, because you have become a great friend to me. And you know that I am your number one, one fan. Uh, learning from you has a blessing because you are a great reference of, for the world of endodontics. Thank, uh, you. thank you for your generosity, uh, for your time, and for your teachings. I'm sure that the new generations of uh, future endodontics who are among us uh, today uh, will enjoy and learn a lot from you. Um, you. I know that many of your students have been people who have also carried endodontics very high standards and they have great admiration uh, and respect for you. Um, today I have a surprise for you because uh, there is some who, uh, uh, someone who estimates you very much and wants to greet you. Um, uh, welcome, Dr. Sandra. Welcome, Dr. Benjamin. Uh, welcome, Dr. Kutler. Uh, 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 it's the honor to have uh, you oh, with means. us. Welcome, you mean Sergio, Sergio, Sergio is there? <laughs> yes. Ah. <laughs> Welcome to the students of the Santa Tomas University and the NOAA University. is going to be able to strengthen these uh, academic ties uh, that unite right. us. And hopefully we can have mm -hmm. more space like this. Hello, Dr. Kutler. Uh, nice to see you. Um, Dr. Aboras, uh, the audience is yours. Okay, very good. So are you saying Sergio Kepler is there? Is he listening to me? <laughs> yes, Marwan, I'm here. How are you? <laughs> what a surprise. Good to hear you. Sorry. First of nice, all, nice to see great. you. You look great. That's great. That's great, my friend. Go ahead. Okay. Listen, I am happy. I am most happy. And thank you, Patricia. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I tell you, since my last trip there, Colombia is always in my heart. And you are always in my mind. And I always wish you the best. And I follow the news, whether it is dentistry or otherwise. You guys are great people. You are a great nation. And uh, all I could say today, I am happy to share my information with you. And I hope you like it. If you don't, let me know. We will discuss it more in the future. So my subject is very dear to my heart. Because when I went to school, I learned very little about it. And then later on, when I became in graduate school of prosthodontics and endodontics in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and later on in California, I really investigated this issue. Is root resorption a physiologic phenomenon or a pathologic <laughs> phenomenon? That's it's going to be important introduction. And I just doctor, excuse me. Yes. Doctor, I'm so sorry. Um well we're gonna have to like make some pauses so we can translate. Uh yes, okay, okay. Tell me when to stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, like uh 
I'll like if you go if you go like with sentences, I can and you stop then I can translate. Oh, so I forgot a... I forgot about you there. I oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Let's 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 do the best. We're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna do a sum up of what you just said and I'll let you know when to start. Okay. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. Great. Bueno, chicos, básicamente. Entonces, para resumir. I'm ready. Okay. He, he could tell me okay so I could start. Okay. Now. You want me to start? Yeah. Can you start? Yeah. Tell, tell the translator to tell me okay. So, or who's going to tell me okay so to stop and go? Okay, uh, uh, I like, I'll give you an okay when to stop and when to yes. start again. Tell me okay. okay. Awesome. Thank you. You could, you could also say okay for stop to stop. No problem. Okay. Just use okay to, for me to stop and go. Okay. So, so what we learned in our undergraduate education. So recently I gave a survey to dental students. And I said, is root resorption for adult dentition, for an adult person, a normal physiologic process or pathologic process? And the answer was 100% normal physiologic process. Okay, go ahead. You're welcome. Like, like, don't stop and just go on. Okay. okay. Don't worry about it. You, you, want me to, work. you want me not to stop? Just continue. I'll go slowly. Yeah, yeah basically that. Okay. So. <clears throat> is how many types of resorption do we have in clinical dentistry? So when I say clinical dentistry, I mean endo, perio, ortho, prosto, oral pathology, and pedodonics or replantation. How many types we have? Well, what we're gonna learn today a classification which we developed at the University of Southern California when I was there. And I've been working on it the past 20 years. And I am so happy to share it with you. So, So what did they learn in the school? That it is a normal physiologic phenomenon. They thought about it as if, if it's strange, will be idiopathic. And we learned this basically the three types. And we depended only on radiographs to diagnose it. It was radiographic diagnosis used a two-dimensional X-ray to diagnose a three-dimensional reality. And that X-ray is not acceptable because you will know at the end of this lecture that any resorption defect less than three millimeters will not show on the radiograph. It has to be bigger than three millimeter. And what we see on x-rays, what you diagnose every day on x-rays 
is only 25% of the reality. And then what I'm going to tell you that just on February 23rd, 2023, Dr. Dow at the University of Southern uh, UCLA in California, okay, they found 31% resorption defects completely unaccounted for, and especially in older people. And that's dangerous because resorption is very slow process. It is always with apical periodontitis. Always, 100%. You have a lesion, you have a resorption. So when it came to management, how do we treat it? Everybody used the wait and see because our undergraduate students did not get a good education on root resorption. A lot of people thought about root resorption at the cervical zone to be root caries. And they repaired it with amalgam or composites. I have cases to show that. So our undergraduate education is insufficient. If it is symptomatic, what did they do? They did the root canal treatment. And you know, today, what you're going to learn that there is a resorption I call period resorption. If you do a root canal, you will lose the tooth very fast. Root canal treatment is contraindicated on some type of resorption, such as cervical root resorption. I had about five cases I lost, just like that, when I did a root canal on them. Why? Because we connecting the outside mat with the inside. And everything outside, the PDL, goes inside when you do a root canal. So not only the diagnosis is different, but the treatment and the prognosis is different. So the general practitioner wait and see. And today, unfortunately, what do they do? When they have a resorption problem, they extract and make an implant which is unacceptable because root resorption is preventable if you diagnose it early. Root resorption is treatable. The only one not treatable is the cervical one. Even the cervical, I use laser to treat. So it's a whole new game a whole new game, but the players, if they are old, they don't know how to play. The new generation should. So how did it start? It started in 1957. In 1957, a man named Bering and Leap. There was a magazine called Kodak, Kodak Photography and X Radiology. And they are the one who gave us those schematics you're going to see in a minute. And then in 1976, Gartner came up with their guidelines, and everybody been living with these guidelines the radiographic guidelines that we all learned, and I am sorry to tell you, question mark. This is bearing and leap guidelines in 1957. The differentiation between internal and external. It is anecdotal. It's not research, it's picture. And you see it in every textbook and in every school and every curriculum. 
Gartner did the best work. Gartner studies, this is Gartner's in 1976. They tried to make sense of it, but unfortunately it's a PA. PA, periapical radiograph, two-dimensional. And what you see, what do you have as a doctor in the clinic? What do you have? You have your eyes, you have a mirror, you have Explorer, you have a perioprobe. You don't have a microscope. And you will see now how unfortunate the literature is. So they have guidelines for internal and external, which I'm not going to go through. You guys, you have a recording of this. You could review it later. So I'm going to go through the, the real thing. So where are we today? Today, I'm going to tell you every dental specialty, clinical, Indo, perio, resto, oral implantology, and replantation, which is basically pediatric dentistry, oral surgery, et cetera, have a problem with root resorption. And tonight, I'm sorry, this morning, from now till noontime, we're going to spend time talk about that. So we have six specialties. They all, these specialty have a problem. And they all have a solution for it. We at USC, when I trained graduate residents and then later on overseas in Saudi Arabia, we basically teach them the core, the knowledge that we learn. We as endodontists know how to deal with root resorption, the so-called AP resorption. The orthodontists know, but this information is not available to GP, and that's very bad because the general practitioner, if they don't know what to do, they will extract and they will do implant or a bridge. And we don't want them to do that. We want them to do endo. We want them to refer to the specialist. So the specialist must teach the GP not to extract, help them and they will reciprocate. So I call it evidence-based knowledge. So what's evidence-based knowledge? You're gonna see it today with every discipline. And as I say, this information should be available to the GP and the dental hygienist. Root resorption is well known. We know the etiology. Root resorption is a pathology complication. Root resorption is a result of substandard endodontic treatment. When you do bad endo, you will develop AP. And with every AP, there is apical resorption. When orthodontics is aggressive and they have too much forces to move the teeth, that will cause resorption. With Invisalign, zero resorption. Why? Because it's interrupted movement and it is only a very, very gentle force. And we will, you know, I investigated all of that. I, I am an endodontist, but I went to the ortho literature, I went to the perio literature, I went to the implantology, the oral pathology. And I got from them what's relevant to us in endodontics, what's relevant to us as a clinician. That's what's important. Okay? Majority of referrals for me when I was in A was from orthodontists and other specialists, not GP, GP extracts. So what is a substandard of care? I said to you, bad care. So when you do bad material, you know, many years ago, calcium hydroxide and pulp cabin caused root resorption, internal resorption. We know that. Today, many materials, many methods could cause that problem. 
So substandard outcome, incorrect diagnosis, lack of preventive care, lack of timely treatment to treat on time early, and failure to follow up. So, so here we are. Essentially, essentially, I'm going to take you in a tour. I know residents and faculty love the literature, right? Well, I went to the literature and I suffered. This is the terms used in cervical resorption. You know, Heather say in 2004, he's an excellent clinician and an author. You know, he cited 14 terms in the literature just to describe invasive cervical resorption. Look at those terms, odontoclastoma, fibrous dysplasia. You see the mix of histology with clinical. You see the mix of histology with location. You see the mix of histology with anatomy, with symptomatology. You see the mix of everything together. And the poor student get lost. He gets these terms. And the clinic, what does he have? A mirror, explorer, and his eyes, and the x-ray. He cannot see supraosseous extra canal invasive resorption. What does that mean? This is only cervical. So there are the other terms. I, I counted 34 count terms. Now look at the ortho one. Orthodontic root resorption, orthodontic pressure root resorption, orthodontic induced inflammatory resorption. This is the one we use today, orthodontic induced root resorption. And then it goes on and on and on. So the, essentially, when you see all of that, look at the internal one, internal resorption, internal granuloma. Are you sure? Are you serious? Idiopathic intermittent resorption, intermittent, symptomatic. Chronic perforating hyperplasia of the pulp, pink pulp spot. And 90% of dental students throughout the world when you say internal resorption, they say the pink tooth. This is not education. This is not education. The general practitioner must have better education than this because the general practitioner has, you will see how much resorption in their practice and they do not know it. And who to blame? The specialist, because the specialist is not teaching. The specialist is trying to protect their, their knowledge, I guess, in different specialties. So spontaneous, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just give you example why I don't like what I see. So what did I do at, this, at uh, USC? At USC, I said, basically, it's a problem based. We in Indo have apical periodontitis, and that resorbed with Tronstad said 100% every time you have AP, microscopically 80% he showed root resorption. And the x ray, forget about it. So basically, we have a problem in Indo caused by endodontic, either pathology. Necrosis, periapical lesion, bad endodontic treatment. So it's an endocost. Orthodontic, periodontic. So basically, by the discipline, it's a problem based. So essentially, we have six types endoresorption, periodisorption, orthoresorption, replantation resorption, oral pathology resorption. You'll see them one by one. This is what we're going to do in the next two hours or whatever. OK. And we're going to start with endodontic resorption. 
I'm going to try to stop at each segment. That was an introduction. Do we have any questions on the introduction? Do you hear me? And we don't have any question. Thank you. Are we doing okay? Yes, everything okay. Thank you. How's the speed of speaking? Should I slow down or go faster? Oh, very well. It's perfect. It's perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. So now we're going to go through these one by one. How is the translators doing? Are they doing okay? Slow down so I can translate like it's like really good uh, the, like everything you're gonna explain now, but like the speed that you're having is perfect, just maybe a tiny bit slower. <laughs> okay, It'd be great. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for helping me in this. Uh, let me just tell you, when we go through the slides, there's too much writing too much information. I'm not gonna read the slides and you go, don't worry about the slides. But let's focus on the pictures, the x-rays and what I say. Okay. So, Thank you. so now we start with our specialty endodontic resorption. Egort's thesis and uh, Dr. Foss in 2009, I guess, or 2004, they did an interesting study, okay? They basically surveyed 712 patients, Dr. Tesis, and 20,000 x-rays, periapicals, which is good. And Igor published it in the journal, uh, I think, International in the Quintessence. They published it in the Quintessence. It's a very good article. You should see it. They found that in the Middle Eastern population, out of those 712 patients, 71% of the resorption, 71% was because of pulp infection, endo. I call it endo. They call it pulp infection. 14% because of ortho. 9% because impaction of the third molar pressure. 3% because of perio. Aha, we are in the same language. So let's look at Indo. Indo is the biggest Resorption we have, here is what I'm gonna cover. Internal resorption alone can be perfor vital, perforative, vital, non-perforative. You won't know that by the x-ray. You will know only when you get in. And you get in and you'll find your files going lateral and continuous bleeding or none. Non-vital, perforative, non-perforative. AP, external endodontic resorption at the apex or periradicular. Here are six possible diagnoses. Do general practitioners know that? They don't. Okay, so let's now, what we're gonna do, we're gonna actually go through cases. So internal resorption, okay, include vital, non-vital, as I in indicated, and basically is caused by physical, bacterial, thermal, pathologic injury to the dental pulp. Pulp injury cause internal resorption. Now, it involves the pulp cavity tissue and surfaces. The prevalence here is the good news. Many years ago, the percentage was one to 5%, 3%. Guess what? 
Dr. Dow in UCLA in February 2023, she just found and her group, by the way, the study is fantastic because it was CBCT done based on the CBCT radiographic report. So it's like a, a specialist reading the CBCT. They found 9% internal resorption and they found 13% epithel. So that's 20, one. The incidence of internal resorption today is one to 3%. Why? Because we do not hurt the pulp as we used to back in the 70s and 80s. Today, the mechanics of doing full crime preparation is either done on adults, it used to be done on young people, as you will see in a minute. So it's very invasive. Here's a case of resorption. Was a pulp cap. This is a pulp cap. I removed the crown. I removed the restoration. I found a pulp cap and here, and then it was perforated down to the spherication. This is important. It's initiated by trauma. Trauma, pulp exposure, pulp capping, chemicals, or thermal injury. Sustained by bacteria. That's important. So it is basically hyperplastic. The best research on it is done by Dr., in my opinion, Wittenberg and Lynn Scott. This is classic research. The problem we have today, when you go into the internet, like we, every, the whole world started in 2000 or 1995. You do not find these articles. And these are the classic article, the good controlled study from Scandinavia, et cetera, okay? So here are some references if you wanna go and follow up. It's basically trauma sustained with bacteria. That's all you wanna know about it. And now I'm gonna show you some cases. So how do I diagnose? We diagnose through the procedure, Sergio, remember this, it's called the 4R operational diagnosis a protocol. And I used this protocol back in 1982 in most of my publications. It's called 4R operational diagnosis protocol. I'm gonna take a couple of minutes, Patricia, just to explain it to your residents and your faculty so you understand it. Because in my opinion, this protocol, protocol means strict. You follow the guidelines. It's so important. I've been doing this for almost 40 years and it's been translated in many languages. And Sergio, remember this. So here it is. It has R1, R2, R3, R4, four R's. R1 is report of the patient. In reporting the patient, you establish the report. Very important to have a relationship. You wanna know you like this patient or not. You wanna treat them or not. You wanna continue or not, and, and so on. So this is what you do in R1. And you identify the problem. You see how urgent is gonna be emergency or is gonna be next visit. You look into the medical concern, the medical history, the drug history. And then the most important is the last item. You do the so-called PPP, patient pain profile. Then you do R2. R2 is radiographic findings, imaging. In imaging, there are two tens, 10 ADI, ADI, areas of diagnostic interest. Areas of diagnostic interest, 10. And the second one is the PC, pulp chamber, diagnostic imaging factors, another 10 in the pulp chamber. And then you go to two kinds of tests, endoperio. 
the pulp test, cold only. I don't use anything else but cold based on evidence. Extreme cold. And then the second test will be perio. So you do pulp testing, CPT, cold pulp test, perio testing, fistula tracking, assess the patient report, how you're doing with the patient. And then you come up with a working diagnosis. And then R4 is the most important. R4 is the restorative and tooth structure assessment. You look at the restorations, good, bad, restorability. You do ROTC, rule out tooth cracks. Rule out tooth cracks, ROTC. You look at attrition, erosion, abrasion. You look at the tooth alignment. You look at the occlusion. And now, when you put R1 with R2, with R3, you, R4 is your, you got it. And now you have 10 reports, gives you a definitive diagnosis. I have not done a tentative diagnosis in my life. Why? Why you wanna do tentative diagnosis? If you can do something definitive. And many times that definitive is no more than restoration removal. No more. No more than just giving a filtration in two minutes and everything clear cut. When you do a definitive diagnosis, it's more, you get a treatment plan. The patient is impressed. You know the problem. Why postpone? And these are, you get the reports. You got medical reports. There's 10 reports you get from that. You know, by you come to R4, you have 10 reports. You put them together, you have a treatment plan and you present it to the patient. So the most important part of that is this. This is the PPP. This is something I did when I was in Pittsburgh and then in California, we revised this seven times. I just revised it recently. When we were with the program, it, we had it translated into Spanish. We had it translated into Italian because, you know, I had residents from different countries. And recently they're doing it in Arabic, et cetera. So why is it color coded? From one to 16, the is the basically the patient history. They tell you all about the history and you could read them. Basically, I had this and I had many feelings and I had some surgery and I had, etc. But this is the key. The key is in color. Traffic signals. The green is reversible. Go. You're not going to need endo. So what are you looking for? The patient will check, check marks. These are verbal descriptors for the patient's symptoms. So if they check 17, 20, 21, 24, and nothing else, then you know they have a reversible pulpitis. These are the statements, the descriptions that describe Reversible pulpitis. It worked. And I had my students, my residents at that time, we, we, we did a lot of work on this. Then you go to the orange. The orange, when you see the check marks here, that means it's becoming to reversal, irreversible pulpitis. Here. Here is the bad zone. This is the endoperial problem, endodontic failures, cellulitis, deep infections. And then the blue is had nothing to do with endo. It's facial TMJ. And if you see patient, check them all here, you got a psycho patient, okay? So anyway, this is now, we're gonna use this with every patient. So I'm, I explained it now, so I don't have to go through it when you see it again. 
Okay. So the radiographic must be supported. And that's what the 4R operational diagnosis do. In the 4R system, you will see how I do it. I basically support R2 with R3 and R4. And I'm going to explain that. These are my cases. None of those from anybody else. All of these I treated in my clinic throughout the years. And I know, because I, you're going to see some of them now, these are clinically confirmed external resorption cases. I did them. OK? Do not always comply with conventional Gartner and other guidelines. These guidelines, you know, this is supposed to be, this is external. So let's look now at internal. This is now all internal. You're going to see them. Look at this one. Doesn't look internal. It's ragged. It looks like external. When I treated this patient, you'll see in a minute, I really thought it's going to be external. Here, it looks like we have a cervical problem. Again, the problem is radiographic examination does not comply, okay, with the reality of what you actually see. So let's see some cases. Here's our first patient. Here's the patient. This patient, when he was young, had crowns. This is before the crowns. This is a long time ago. These are teaching cases. After the crowns, he developed these pathologies. Okay. And this is the pain history. This is how you read it. Let me give you the profile of this. I have pain. I had my filling done in California. The pain prevents me from sleeping. The pain comes and goes. I notice the pain during weeks. The pain occurs only when I take cold liquids. The pain is getting worse and constant. The pain occurs spontaneously by itself. The pain awakened me at night. She is going to the orange zone. And then the pain is causing me headaches. Okay. And this is R2, radiographic findings. So what do we do with radiographic finding? We have, we thought there is something called the 10 ADI. The 10 ADI is essentially guidelines from the literature and I added to them, okay? The study by Brynoff, Ingrid Brynoff. May God rest her soul. Ingrid Brynoff was a radiologist dentist radiologist. She did the only documented research in history about the accuracy of x-rays to the real situation. She basically had patients who were died, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours. They had biopsies and she compared the radiograph to the actual x-ray to the actual biopsy slides. So if I took some of her guidelines, I added to them, and I call them the 10 ADI. This is what I teach. This is what we do. We start with the clinical crown. We go to the chamber. We come to the root canal. We go to the apex, then to the predontal ligament, then to the lamina dura, then to the periapical tissue, back to periradicular tissue, then we go to the alveolar bone crest, and also we look at adjacent teeth. Here we have a, a bicuspid with two roots, you can see here. Here we have a mandibular alveolar I IAN, the inferior alveolar nerves. And here we have impaction. And we basically tell the student, look from the periphery to the center. You don't start here, we start at the periphery. This is now the system we use to tell the students how to read, interpret x-ray. So when you do this continuously, okay, we tell them what to look for in terms of endodontics. We focus on the lamina dura. Lamina dura is the most important landmark in dentistry. 
because the lamina dura and the periodontal ligament is the first tissue to disappear and the last tissue to come back after healing, okay? So we want them to focus. So look at this patient. They, he's a lamina dura, lamina dura, lamina dura, lamina dura, lost it, lost it, lost it. Here we have PDL thickening, pushed it out. Look here, epical third is gone, pathology. Pathology coming from inside out because of this situation going on here. Look at this beautiful lamina dura here. So what's a lamina dura? Lamina dura basically is the lining of the socket with the alveolar crest. So this is external over here, and this is internal. Very important landmark in endodontics and periodontics. Okay. And we want people to look at the environment, the environment. Here we have impaction. Here we have mandibular canal. Here we have another bicuspid. And then something recently I developed, I call them the pulp chamber diagnostic imaging factors. The pulp chamber diagnostic imaging factors. To me, the pulp chamber is so important in, in the endodontic diagnosis, so important. And I have guidelines, okay? And there are 10 guidelines, age and the tooth type. Is it anterior, posterior, how old the patient? We wanna know the anatomic integrity of the pulp chamber. It's being violated here. The imaging technique, by twin, PA or CBCT. By twin and PA are the best for the pulp chamber. What about CBCT? No good. What about OPG? No good. Only by twink and PA. Here is opacity or radiolucency. Radiolucency, opacity. Health, disease. The size, none. Look at the walls, look at the roof, look at the floor, look at the walls. Sickness. Not normal. This is a factor. Pulp stones. These are free pulp stones. These are identicals. Associated with periodontal disease. Attached and unattached calcification. So we want these very important for diagnosis, especially whether you have root resorption or not, or you're going to be doing endo or not. And then we do R3 with basically the pop test. So that's all done. Then we do the perio. The perio is a standard. Plaque index, six point PD, pocket depth measurement, attachment level, bleeding on probing, mobility, and fistula if you have it. This is the buckle, this is the lingual. Now, this is key. This is important slide. After I examine the patient with CPT, with cold pulp test, I explain to them that to really do a good job diagnosing them, we need to anesthetize the area and I need to explore the surface of the tooth itself. And that's how I differentiate between internal and external. So following this, we anesthetize the buccal and lingual. This is what I said. R3 support R2. Rule out external resorption by cavitation test, and then so on and so forth. We did this to the buccal, we did this to the lingual, and we continue. And then we come to R4, and then endodontic was done, and so forth. Second case, this is the patient here. Now we're going to go a little bit faster now. This patient had orthodontic treatment. And then she had a trauma. The tooth was extruded, intrus intrusive. You see it intrusive, intruded. Now, and you have this defect. Okay. I basically expected this to be external root resorption, but look, every time you have external, you will have a pocket. You will have a bleeding. Look at this beautiful gingiva. Look at this health. We probe nothing. And endodontic treatment, and you can see the closure. 
this was non-vital, this is it, non-vital, non-perforative internal resorption. So this was a resorption going on internal. Then she got a trauma. The pulp died. It stopped. Resorption stopped, but we still have the discoloration and the problem. Okay, this is another case. This patient came to us with this defect. Okay. Examined the patient. They said they had this x-ray 10, 15 years before. And they had the fistula tract. I treated the case. Laid the flap. Examined the area. And this is the fistula tract before. And this is after. Basically, it was perforative. The internal resorption perforated into the periodontal ligament space. The pulp died, stopped. Nature did its own root canal. That's perforative, non-vital internal resorption. Okay? And this is showing you the healing after I basically bleached the endodontic and bleached the tooth. Then we come to our most important entity. That is AP. Believe it or not, you're all familiar with the literature, but it's so important that before 1990, doctors, there was a lot of people thought that granuloma is a sterile. Would you believe that? They believe that apical granuloma, if the patient is asymptomatic, is sterile. Okay? Sunquist was the most classic study in which he found 12 strains of, you know, 90% aerobic and anaerobic and aerobic bacteria, mixed flora, et cetera. And basically, here is our game. This is the most serious resorption we have in dentistry, especially now. And I'm going to tell you why. AP is a bacterial destructive disease that breaks down the alveolar bone, the dentin, and cementum. Look how destructive it is. Look at this. According to the AE, you have the definition, symptomatic and asymptomatic. You got them. The literature has 14 terms for AP. It is caused by failure of vital pulp therapy and substandard endodontic treatment. Doctors, it takes seven to 10 years for pulp cap to fail. And when it fails, it gives you AP. It takes five to 10 years for an old root canal to fail. And when it fails, it gives you AP. Crown preparations, 10 to 13%. Eventually, the tooth will develop necrosis. <clears throat> and then you get AP. So what we used to think about it, it is now documented, but it takes time. Now watch these numbers. Doctors, these numbers are scary. The prevalence of AP globally, the worldwide, there's research on that. Endodontically untreated teeth is 3% to 7%. I looked at every country. I have surveyed every country GP do root canals. 80% of root canals done by general practitioners in the United States. 20 million, 17 to 20 millions every year. 70 to 80% done by GP. Canada, the same. Brazil, you name it, same. Listen to this. The global prevalence 
of AP in endodontically treated teeth is 24 to 60%. 60%. When you do bad endo, you're going to have 60% AP. That means with AP, you have root resorption. And you know the consequences in a minute. So this is not good. Why are dentists doing substandard endodontics? Because the quality of education is inferior. They're not getting good education in my opinion, at least the places I've gone through. And you know the pulp, it's the pulp. It's the pulp the cause. The pulp is the cause. And you have all kinds of pulp, chronic, inflamed, necrotic, and you don't know that with, the, with, with your patient. Endodonic disease is very slow disease. AP is 100% asymptomatic. It's episodic. It flares up and then settles down. And if we wait and see, if that's our education, ask the patient, does it hurt? Patients say no. Okay, we keep an eye on it. This is bad. You are teaching the patients not to do anything when you say, okay, we watch it. You don't watch disease. You treat it. You prevent it. So we, this is the terminology for AP. They call it, this is good slide. So you don't get confused. I call it AP, period. And thanks to the AE, they, they just basically settled the controversy. We don't call them granuloma. We don't call them epical lesion. We call, call them epical reducency, acute periodontitis. All of these are under one umbrella, AP. So under AP, you could have radicular cyst, you could have lateral cyst, you could have uh, condensing osteitis, you could have all of these things, okay? So let's just basically clear your mind. There are two kinds of periodontitis, only two, marginal at the crystal bone and apical at the root end. So when you explain that, it's easier for the general practitioner to comprehend it. So this is the study which I mentioned to you, Igor Tasis. They did basically an excellent study. I, I absolutely love it. They did 712 patients, 20,000 teeth, and basically, they found resorption in 28% of the patients. Okay, 20.5, so, but 71% was endo. Okay, 14% central incisor, but makes about 4% of ortho. Perio, 1% oral pathology is more than perio, and you're going to see that in a minute. Now, why this excite me? Because there was a, a very excellent name in our literature, Maury Massler. He was a pedodontist, but he also did endo. Maury always said resorption is physiologic because they did not want to blame dentistry. They see resorption, oh, that's normal. It's not normal. It's normal only in kids, okay? So that's the concept there, very important concept. If we wanna manage a problem, we need to identify it and then we manage it. So as I said, it's, you, you know all about it. It's external, it's basically destroyed the dentin, is the cementum. And the key element here that bone will come back but the tooth will never come back. And you're gonna see now the results affecting us as clinician. 
Of course, we have biofilms. You, we don't need to go through that. This is now what we're talking about, you know, the, the AP. Again, this is AP, 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 and AP. This is AP with bad indo, substandard indo. And it is very destructive. You can see now, this tooth was of my cases, you see the crack there, okay? So the cause ne never gone and resorption continued. So what are the consequences? This is, I'm gonna stay here for a minute. So what happened when you have the apical uh, endodontic resorption? You lose the apex. You lose the CDJ, cemento-dentinal junction. And you know what does that mean? When you lose a cemento-dental junction, measurement becomes an issue, instrumentation becomes an issue, you have overfill, you have all kinds of problems, especially now when people are using questionable root canal sealers, okay? It softens the epical dentin, you have widening of the epical foramen, and then of course you compromise the crown root ratio. And of course, this is the famous Dr. Cutler is here. His dad, God rest his soul, was fantastic, fantastic man who contributed so much to our literature, okay? And you remember now the canal major and canal dimer minor, and you're looking at about 200 micron at size 20. So we know all of that, all of that controllable. And then you know also about all the percentages of accessory canals, lateral canals, the you know, statistics and all of that. It's mostly at the epical third. And all of that is gone when you have resorption. All right. So that means, you know, when I was in private practice, when I have AP, I always told my patients, I'm going to do combination treatment. I will do the endo, and then I'll finish it with surgery. Because I had no, I have no idea how the case is going to end up, and I don't want to do extraction. Okay. There is always that possibility because resorption, you see it mesial, you see it distal, you never see it buccolingual, and you don't know how much is it till you get in. This is why we like to do negotiation. And this is the complications. <laughs> the complication, difficult measurement, you're gonna have, you know, again, again, the, these people using sodium hypochlorite injected in the canal, frightening, absolutely frightening, the techniques that we see. And now we have all kinds of systems, uh, irrigation systems and all of that. And the, we are focusing so much on, technique and materials, and we're not teaching Indo. We're not teaching Indo. We're teaching how to use instruments. Okay, so, so we continue. All of these cases, the MAC cases, all right? And uh, we basically, we have overfilling, underpack. So you have an over, you may have underpack. Again, you need to require surgery to remove the overfill. Uh, that complicate post placement, and you have no room for a good post. And then you have the pathology complication. You have increased micro leakage, and you have tooth discoloration from the failure. And then, of course, the lesion gets bigger and becomes critical size defect. C, S, D critical size defect. These are huge. Anything more than 10 millimeters, we consider it critical size defect. That requires endo, non-surgical, and surgical, and you need some to use some augmentation. Okay, and again, uh, that's the PVP, the pain history. And again, the x-ray will be basically, as I have stated, will be PA, bite wing, 
or 100% recommended the CBCT. CBCT gives you a lot of information, okay, about resorption. All right, um, let me continue. Pretty radical. This, these are also. This is AP, 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 and here you have another AP. You do the pulp test negative. You do the perio. You get all your data about the perio, whether it is periodontal probing or sounding. Okay, this is the second case. This is the case I want to focus on. This case <clears throat> published in Dr. Engel's first text in 1965. It was, doing a, it was a courtesy from Dr. Clifford Ames in 65. This is published in his book, which I have. I just want to stay here for a minute. This is an incredible case. It's not my case, but I use it here to support clinically my philosophy. This patient had lesion and had resorption. You see here the cratering. They use gutta percha and they use silver point. But you can see now the silver point here is a master. Large, parallel walls, tight fit. And look at the healing. Good endo stops root resorption. So the treatment of root resorption in endo is in good endo, not bad endo. But the bone came back. Look at the lamina dura, came back. Look at it here, it's gone. Look at it here, gone. Here, coming back. Slowly, even here, coming back. So the bone will come back. The bone will regenerate, but the tooth will not. Okay? And don't tell me an implant is the answer. Your tooth is the answer. Okay? Especially, we know what is the situation with implantology, survival versus failure, et cetera, et cetera. This is one of my cases. Again, AP. Okay, so to interrupt. Uh, yeah, that place. Um, the, the material that, that it, was, it was used on the left. No, 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 the one before. Yeah, that one. Um, on the shorter one, on the shorter one, uh, the one that has the reabsorption, uh, what material did they use there? They use gutta percha here. Yeah. With ZOST. This is back from 60s, 1965. Yeah. And okay. silver point. This is silver point. And they, they, at silver that time, point. they, at that time, they used silver point. And okay. the silver point they used at that time, it was large size, and they basically machined by hand the canal so the silver point will fit perfectly oh. at the apex and the body, and okay. cemented, and cemented with, you know, zinc phosphate. Okay, let me explain that to them. Thank you, Doc. Yes, this is like a history. The reason I'm showing you this, how the indoor, good indoor stops resorption, stops it, but does not stop period resorption. It makes it worse. Okay, we continue. All right, this is again, one of my cases. This case was actually destined to extraction and I told the patient, I convinced the patient to treat her we did basically combination endo and surgery, all right? And I want you to see here the body reaction. Here you see pathology. Here, this is critical size defects, all right? Look at this tooth here. 
got injury, and then again, the calcification. Look at there, no pulp chamber. It's all calcified. Here, you have a big lesion. So anyway, make a long story short, this is my treatment. Combination, retrofill and apical trimming and condensation, period. First, you can see the crown root ratio. These patients still have the tooth till now, 20 years. What I'm trying to say to you, and please pay attention carefully. We in Indo do not need bone augmentation, endodontic treatment does the best bone regeneration. This bone here is denser bone. Well, and very good yes, we're going to. Like, what? Uh, we, we got some information, so we will go to somebody who said, uh, like, in the Atlantic, we don't need. Uh, what was the question again? I don't hear you, sir. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can yes, I do. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, you were saying like, like you were making a lot of emphasis uh, on what they don't, they don't do on endodontic or what they're not supposed to do. But after that, we couldn't hear you. Okay, <clears throat> what I'm trying to say to everybody that <clears throat> good endodontic treatment provide the best bone for implant dentistry. Because if this doctor now wants to extract this tooth, this bone is excellent, okay? Endodontic treatment regenerate the bone from the patient. You'll see this in a minute. Here's another case. This case, this patient here, 75 years old. She was referred to me for emergency care. The dentist in Pasadena was planning to extract this tooth and place an implant. But the patient developed symptoms before they went to the implant doctor. The dentist sent me the patient to take care of her. She came to me and she said, Dr. Marwan, do I really need to lose this tooth? I said, you know, it looks calcified, it looks old, you have a big abscess. Sometimes, you know, we try root canal and you are having pain now. So let me open the tooth. Let me just open it and do emergency. So I made an access opening and this is how far I was able to go, only to here. I drained it, okay, and then Basically, I closed it. I, it took me two visits. Then the patient disappeared for eight months, six months. She came back to me eight months later like this. And she said to me, I'm gonna later on have this tooth removed and do implant. I said, fine, you could do that. And now if you do, you don't have to go to the sinus. You don't have to use the long implant. You have good bone. And the doctor said, thank you. And they removed the tooth and placed an implant. So what is my story I am telling you? Endodonic treatment can be used for a variety of reasons to eliminate pain and to restore AP and to regenerate bone. And that's what I call the interim endo philosophy. This is one of them to show you that only we need, look, I don't even have a retrofill. 
this was calcified. All I had to do was a curatage, curatage, and this is the result. It was good for about a year. And what did we gain? We gained a new bone, the patient's bone. No augmentation. Okay. All right. Here's another case. And you go there. And this is another case also in which you have a silver point pushed out. Defective root canal, two canals. Here's the fistula tract. Goes right there. Basically, I laid a flap. I removed the silver point. I removed it with a, with a hemostat, moved it out this way. And then I placed retrofill in its place. And you could see the healing right there. OK? And now the dentists can do whatever they want, whether they want. This is show you that we can treat AP successfully, OK? And you know the percentage is the 90%. And if you do good surgery, is a 90% also. OK, we finished indoor resorption. We have any questions on indoor resorption? Uh, we don't have any questions. Thank you. Okay, we continue now. I think now we're going to have less material, and we continue. This is the basically orthodontic resorption. We have three types of orthodontic resorption. Okay, three types, and basically, the best work on this was done by Berziak and Wasserstein. Excellent, excellent orthodontics, and basically, they introduced this term. Berziak and Wassertine, they call it orthodontic induced inflammatory resorption. I don't like this word histology. It's just orthodontic induced orthodontic. That's enough. Okay. Basically, they consider it you're getting cosmetic versus resorption. Okay, that's a different discussion. Here is the types. In orthodontic resorption, we have three types. Cemental, or call it surface, and remodel with cementum. Dentinal, so the de cementum is gone, and you have very little dentin you could see. That's called deep. With repair. And the third one, circumferential, and that is basically when you lose the root end. This is now the circumferential. OK, so let me show you what I have done. This is the different types. Histologically, orthodontic resorption, 70 to 90%. So you have it in every case, 70 to 90%. Radiographically, okay, you see it in between, after the treatment, you see about 70% of the cases. You do not see the lesion. You do not see the resorption if it is more than two to four millimeters, okay? And then this is the good news. The bad one where you lose four to five millimeters, it's only half to 5%. 5%. Five percent. Five percent. The most teeth involved are the maxillary central. The shape, whether the apex is blunder, bayonet, curved or not, has nothing to do with resorption. There is no relationship between the root shape, the apex shape, and the resorption. Okay? So the five models, here they are. Essentially, this is the slide I want you to focus on. There's no resorption here. This is the first type, cemental, with repair. 
This is now the circumferential. And this is the one that you have half to 5%. This is where you lose the whole apex. Now this has importance to us. Here are the factors. We get more resorption. This is more and less resorption. So if the orthodontist in hypo functional PDL, you have more. Functional PDL, that's Invisalign, everything functioning, less. Intact cementum, less. Damage cementum, more. Cortical bone, more. Sponges bone, less. Abnormal occlusion. Treatment mechanics. Prolonged trauma. Unbalanced chewing pattern, more. Treatment duration, long ortho, more. Previous ortho, more. Age of the patient, more. Not Invisalign. Specific teeth, the anteriors, upper and lowers. Heavy forces, more. Continuous forces, more. Invisalign is interrupted. Interrupted. When you eat, you remove it. It stops. Bruxism, more. Excessive use of incisors, more. Endodontic treatment, more or less. So anatomically, you lose that much. You lose the cementodentinal junction. That's key. That's of interest to us as endodontists. And I'll show you in a minute why. Again, you could see now a very important, the lamina dura, it's coming back. This guideline, you could apply it in perio, you could apply it in endo, you could apply it ortho. So you see resorption in ortho. Look for the lamina dura. Look for the predontal space. When the patient is active, you're gonna see more period problem. But when everything is settled, it's different. Again, top testing, especially important. You need to test CPT, okay? Don't trust, you know, I, I've seen orthodontists don't they even take x-rays before and after. So you need to do the test. So basically, you will have compromised crown root ratio. This is a patient here, which I seen recently. She had most of her dentition, you know, lengthy treatment and very aggressive. This is what I call it invasive orthodontic treatment. Okay, thank God it's not everywhere, okay? All right, this is why interest to us. Now, you lose the C, Cemento dental injunction with orthodontic resorption. But what happens, doctor, if you don't have pathology, they, you have regeneration of cementum, okay? And if for some reason you're doing endo, that cementum is basically closing a very large foramen. So you go in and you see some resistance. But if you accidentally perforate the cementum that regenerated, the canal goes from size 20 at the apex to size 90. Boom. And now you have a major situation. And then you have to now try your test totally different. This is one of the cases I did. You see the cratering, okay? Then you no longer can use the measurement techniques. You have to really try to do a combination trial. So basically you lose this and you have pulp pathology AP and then open apex and the prognosis is good. Okay, your pulp test and the, basically the diagnostics, we already mentioned all of that. Okay, and the imaging. Something else I found, uh, doctors, Samishima from USC, 
he found something interesting. He said that the OPG showed 20% more resorption than periapical films. So you want to tell, you don't want to read resorption in OPG. You want to read resorption in PA or CBCT. We know that. OPG is difficult to determine root shape. Periapical radiograph are more accurate. We agree. Okay, now this is my case. Case, I don't mean me. This is one of my patients. I want you to see this. This is the OPG. This is OPG, orthopentograph. Okay, and these are the same T's. Look at this. So look at the central. <coughs> see this lateral? Here it is. You see this lateral? Look at it here and look at it there. Look at the central. This one versus that. You do not want to diagnose resorption of any type with OPG. You don't. Sad. I look at the literature. A lot of people using OPG for diagnosis, period. They're not taking FMX, they're not taking CBCT. All right? So this is an important issue. Again, this is another one. You can see the imaging. Here is a pathology, resorption, resorption, and here you have a pathology. Okay. Again, active, resorption, root canal calcification. Look at this one, calcification, no calcification. Disrupted lamina dura. Look at the lamina dura. Disrupted and one before. Thickening PDL. These are the guidelines you get when you have orthodontic resorption. Blurred tubercular bone, monitor vitality through CVCT. All right. And then, okay. And then you do the pulp test. You're familiar with all of that. Basically, okay. Then we come to periodontal resorption. Periodontal resorption is interesting. Basically, we basically have different types. Again, I will go through them in periodontal resorption. This is periodontal resorption. And we're gonna treat this case in a few minutes. Etiology basically, Brushing, compression, cauterization, and infection to the periodontal ligament. Resorption defect observed on the surface of the roots with injured, injured, injured cementum and PDL. That's the key. Injury to the cementum and the periodontal ligament. Okay, so what are the dental things we do? A few years ago, they introduced the so called Intraligmaget injection. We used to inject anesthesia into the PDL. Guess what? Root resorption. Because you are essentially traumatizing the periodontal ligament and cementum. Severe orthodontic forces, buccal lingual, mesiodistal. Aggressive SRB, aggressive scaling and root planing. Periodontal surgery, occlusal trauma, and traumatic injury, laxation, subluxation. All of that is part of the etiology of very important, however, not too common, periodontal resorption. This is by uh, Andreessen. Now, watch this. Okay, pulp necrosis with AP, like sub subluxation, loosening, intrusive luxation, extrusive luxation, and extra articulation. Okay. And you could see now 80 to 90% when you have avulsion, extra articulation, of course. Look at it now when you have localized cementum necrosis. This 
but you also still get periodontal resorption. And here, with the relaxation, intrusion, and you also get resorption. So we have to do trauma. So periodontal disease, this is all the etiology we went through. This is periodontal disease resorption right here. You can see now how the bone, we lost a lot of tooth structure here. This is periodontal disease. This is periodontal disease. We did the root canal. Look at that. We have a closure, but look at this. Look how much tooth structure resorbed. This lesion, periodontal disease. Yeah, periodontal disease everywhere. Lost a lot of tooth structure. Part of etiology, bleaching chemicals, endodontic filling heat instruments, tetracycline antibiotic root conditioning, citric acid etching. One of the most been reported in the literature, exposure of the dentin, 11% lingual 23% buccal. What does that mean? The enamel and the cementum, they not, they're leaving space between them. So when you have a bleaching chemical here, it comes out and creates this resorption. All right? You're gonna have a better understanding of this in a minute. So what are the types of periodontal resorption? The most common radiographic sign of periodontal resorption is calcification of the canal. The pulp starts closing. The canal becomes narrow. Why? Invasion. Caries on the crown, resorption in the root, period resorption. And basically you can see now resorption. In addition to that, you have the periodontal pocket. So what's so classic about periodontal resorption, you always have soft tissue damage. You have a pocket, you have a bleeding gingiva, and you have calcifying pulp, pulp canal, calcifying, closing. Okay? I want you to keep attention to this case. This is external resorption, periodontal resorption, some trauma caused here, and this is the root canal. Okay. Here is another resorption. You can see now resorption, and you see this walls of dentin, trying the pulp pulling back and trying to protect itself. Of course, we all know, you all know about the you know, Andreessen and Horting and Hansen, you know, classification. I'll just go through it very quickly. They basically, I like it, but it's histology. I, I can't use it, okay? I'm a clinician, all right? So you have surface, you have inflammatory replacement. All resorptions are inflammatory, all of them, okay? Matter of degrees, okay? But here it is, you should know about it but it should not confuse you. You are a clinician. All right, so let me explain them to you. Surface resorption, according to Andreessen, Horting, and Hansen, it's a small resorption cavity on the root surface adjacent to a normal or slightly extended periodontal ligament. Like this, here, and you have it there. The second one, Okay, surface resorption, you see it here. Uh, you can even see it right there. The inflammatory is ball shape. Cavity with surface associated with similar resorption cavity on the adjacent alveolar bone, like here and there. It's a ball shape. And then, here it is. You can see the canal there. there. And then the third time replacement resorption, disappearance of the PDL with or without root contact. 
Okay, so basically it's in game. Now, in my dictionary, okay, you'll see in a minute. So replacement resorption, here it is clinically. And of course, we mentioned about the anatomic disposition, the relationship between the enamel and cementum, cementodental junction, enamel. Of course, you're all familiar with the Heather Say classification. The only thing about it, it involved the root and the crown. Fine. It's by itself as cervical invasive resorption. All right. Here is the mechanism. The mechanism, you have the odontoblast, cementoblast, osteoblast. The, the whole idea that cementum and periodontal ligament has material known as anti-invasive factor, anti-invasive factor. When this material is gone, dentin is exposed and then you're gonna have a problem. This is the research by Linz, Sark and Hammerston back in 1980, extremely important research. And, and they basically saying that the dentin class, the cemento class, the amylo class, the chondro class, the osteoclast, all of these cells, okay, they, they basically cause the resorption. Once you have this protective layer of cementum and the periodontal ligament, okay. And then we can continue now. Imaging of periodontal defect, the mandible, okay. PA is ideal for detection of small defects. Okay, more than 50% defects imagine, uh, imaged by PA were not imaged by OPG. This is for perio. So if you have a perio problem, don't use the OPG. PA or bite wing or CBCT. Okay. Uh, Ekerson in 1992 did an interesting study where they did measurement, radiographic measurement with digital radiograph versus real gold, real surgery. And they found that it's very, very close. And that's why I believe Ingrid Brine of studies are very good. There is so much, if you have a good digital radiography, you're very close to what you see in real life. All right, so here we are, some cases. Okay, we do the testing. All right. All of these, we anesthetize the buccal and we check the cavitation test. This is now some of the cases we had at the school. This is my practice one on the left. Now I mentioned, look at the gingiva, there is a pocket. Look at the gingiva here, same situation, and here, all right. Now, how I'm doing it, okay, I've done a lot of cases, surgery and non and wait and see and all of that, and this is the bottom line. I use basically laser surgery and DIAG. The best is at early staging. You could also do orthodontic extrusion, I don't. And you wanna basically be sure that it is in one surface. Once it's advanced to other surfaces, mesial, proximals, you are talking about different. This is the case I want you to remember. And this reflects my philosophy. This is one of my cases. This patient had two things, cold. And we saw the resorption. And my, okay, decided to do root canal. The minute we did the root canal, we connected between the outside, that's the oral environment is here. Basically, this is the mouth bacteria. This is the resorption and it's all here. And then the minute you do enlargement of the canal orifice, you basically connecting inside and outside. You're adding insult to injury. You're adding insult to injury. You either have to do a biologic root canal, try not to connect with the pathology outside, or just don't do it. And you're gonna see 
some examples also. In my opinion, endodontic treatment exaggerate external resorption. Since we've done those cases, here's another case. This is a case of external resorption, cervical, okay? And the patient had some sensitivity. I made the mistake of doing a root canal. I lost the tooth in two, three weeks. Look at that. You're basically going in, making access, bacteria. You're putting the sodium hypochlorite coming out. If you use medication, I don't use, but any medication you use here will be out here. You basically trauma on top of trauma. So you can see now access opening, and then you can see the invasiveness. We lost the canine. After these cases, four or five of them back in California, I stopped. I had done some recently. Okay, so here more case. This is recent one I did. This is what I do now. Basically, I could use the laser if it's in one surface and control it. You're gonna see a case. But this is one of the cases recently I did provisional. To, I consider this provisional. This is the palate, was not on the buckle. So basically, I lay a flap, look at the closure, the canal is all closed. As I told you, external resorption, in the periodontic, periodontic resorption, the canal closed, and you go into closure. Right. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, in Bruta, uh, the guys are asking how you treat that. Like, uh, how like how you like got in there, and what do you use, and like, I'm, uh, yeah, and I'm, what I'm, kind I'm, of material do you use uh, to treat I'm that? I'm explaining. I'm explaining that right now. Uh, yeah, yeah. But can you start from the top, please? Is we don't yeah, like. like Sometimes we get like back signal and your voice just gets cut off. And okay, okay, no problem. Yeah, when, when, thank you. You may, go, you may go back? Yeah, yeah, please. No, 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 not as far. Like the case you, yeah, that, like what you did okay. before, we got it, but what you're doing now is what we didn't get. Okay. Basically, this patient had periodontal external resorption, it was non invasive. How do I know? I can't tell. All I know that I have this defect. This defect was full with granulation tissue, periodontal. So I laid basically a buccal flap. There was no defect on the buccal. It was on the palatal, all right? So I essentially curated. I controlled the bleeding with laser. And I basically go here and I could see solid tooth structure, there was no bleeding, the canal is closed, okay? There's nothing I could do here, all right? So I told the patient, all I could do is provisionalize this. This is essentially a glass ironomer cement, okay? It has an excellent looting capabilities. Or you could acid etch and do composite. So you have two options, either bonded composite, but you need to have the area dry, okay? Or glass iron or cement. The patient should know this is a provisional treatment. This treatment now has been gone for seven years, seven years, and he's still doing exactly like this. They come back, I check them, the resorption stopped. Why did it stop? Because I removed all the clastic cells around here on the lingua. Surgery is important in this. And you're going to see one more. Doctor, I had a question. Um, yes. Why, why uh, not, you, not use Jerry Store in this case? Say that again? Not using what? Uh, why not use Jerry Store for this case? Why bonded composite instead of Jerry Store? No, no, no. I'm using glass iron and cement. Okay. Would you glass, use? Sorry, go ahead. The modified, the modified glass iron and cement. 
better than. It has excellent adhesive qualities. And it doesn't dissolve. And the area has no pressure. The biggest problem with glass armor cements that you cannot put them under mastication, under forces or occlusal forces. Here, there is no occlusal forces. This is just like a class five. This is why glass armor cement is excellent for a class fives. And this is what I consider subgingival. Okay, composite technique will be also okay, but it's more demanding technically. Okay, let me continue and I'm gonna show you another case. This case, 75 years old, okay. Pain history and all of that. We have two teeth. We did one, the bicuspid. I went through this one. You see the canal, the, this is all intact. I basically had the pulp exposure here on the cervical zone. I basically just went in and I treated it in the buckle right from here. Okay. This is modification of access. You know, this is dentistry. This is what I call biologic root canal. You, you never understand that term. Basically, I'm removing the tissue that caused pain or infection. And I'm giving the patient, okay, relief from symptoms, from pain. I am not going to do a post and a crown. This is what I call biologic root canal. I do them for cracked teeth. Cases like this just basically remove the, the problem. Okay? I do that for crack teeth because I don't need to do a post. I don't need to have excessive flare. I don't do that. Just basically remove the tissue. The, if you have bacteria, this patient had essentially pulpitis. We removed the pulp and we did the treatment. The tooth next door. Okay, I did something else, the canine. Okay, the canine. This is the canine. But the canine, I did NDAG laser. This is now the tooth next door. I put composite here. This is what I remember that. This is now laser. This is laser. Then here it is. Look at that. Okay, you can see now the, the lacunae from the resorption, all right? I did not get any bleeding. The patient had no pain. This is the tooth right there. No pulp exposure. Here it is my philosophy. So essentially, we should look at the pulp. It's perforative, non-perforative. Internal resorption, perforative, non-perforative. Periodontal resorption, perforative to non-perforative. Perforative to what? To the pulp. That's the key. That's the key. If it has not perforated to the pulp, you have a good prognosis. And the other cases, the pulp pulled back. It calcified. Okay? So I'm talking about this guy did not want to lose his central. This woman, this lady did not want to lose her canine and she's 75 years old. And here it is now, you can see it now, the post-surgery. This is the tooth next door. Okay, let me go back again so you understand this case. This tooth here, we did root canal, direct biologic right to the canal to the end. We left the, this intact. Okay, see here's the clinical crown, all right? And let me show it to you now. Here it is. This is after I did the root canal, I put composite. I closed it. She's happy. All right. And this is now the canine. And here is the composite. This is there. It's finished. Then we come to oral pathology resorption. 
again, perforative or non-perforative. This is such an important area, neglected. Oral pathology resorption is a huge problem. And uh, again, Dr. Uh, Tessis, you remember they found about 9%, I mean 3% oral pathology in their finding. You basically have a dental impaction, cysts or tumors, or non-dental. This is what you see, pathology, and you see the resorption. Pathology, pathology, this is from the literature, from this guy here, it is from university in India. Okay, and you see the resorption. This is non-odontogenic nasopalatine cyst. 80 to 96% of impacted teeth showed resorption against the tooth they are leaning against. This canine, look what's doing to the central. That's rare, but this is the problem. This is a huge problem and we're not paying attention to it. It affects us. Why? Because this tooth may not be important, but this tooth is very important. So the impaction of the third molar, mesioangular, mesioangular, 80% of all impaction is mesioangular. Against the second. So, you can see all of that, the mandible and the maxilla. Here are some of my cases. So the third molar impaction, global incidence of impaction, 24%. Mesioangular, 64%, I said 70. And you basically, look what's happened, look at this data. Look at this information. And the second molar, 48% incidence of caries here because of this. And they don't wanna pull the third molar. They don't wanna remove the impacted tooth. But you can see now, this caries eventually is gonna perforate into the pulp. This caries is going to make pulp stones here. I have a study now here in which we found pulp stones associated with this angulation issue. Bone loss, 11%. Pockets, 42%. You're going to have a permanent pocket here. Pericoronitis, 24%. And pericoronitis is one of 3%, listen to this important information. 90% of people go to dentists because of toothache. Toothache. 36% pulpitis. 50% AP. 3% perio. 3.9% pericoronitis from third molar impaction. Why? This is our, this is in our specialty because it's gonna affect us. They're gonna to come to us with what? They're gonna pulp cap this. You imagine pulp capping the distal? Okay, and AP, percentage is this. All right. So then you're going to get all this information, which I just going to repeat. And as I said, you have pockets, pathologies, and exposure, and caries. Here's the pericoronitis. Okay. So every time the patient eat, the prevalence, look at the prevalence. Prevalence of pericoronitis, 29.36%. But it's responsible for 3% of the toothache. 3% of toothache caused by pericoronitis. All right. 
areas of the second and third bodies are difficult to keep clean, subject to caries or periodontal disease, all right? Now, we go up, let's go to the maxilla. The maxilla is worse. Why? Because my friends, if you remember, down the molars in the bottom have only one furca. The buccal furca goes to the lingua. The upper molars have three furcations, buccal, mesial, and distal. Buccal, mesial, distal. So when this thing here comes down, it's gonna expose the distal furca right there. And then the pathology goes in and damage everything else. See, this is the distal furca being damaged right there. Okay, so you understand now the issue of the third molar. The good news, once you remove the third molar, resorption stops. So that's good news. Resorption stops and carries stops, but depend how far is it from the pulp. What I do, I basically, you could see here what I did, you know, this see the, how resorption did to this. I just basically did uh, root canal and I did uh, uh, hemisection. I just basically hemisection this tooth here. I still believe in hemisection and root amputation. I do them all the time. The periodontists doing implants, endodontists we are doing their, the work they used to do. We do a lot of it, okay? We do a lot of surgery and that's part of the method that you could save for the patient. That's if the patient wants. Okay, here's, here's another case, same situation. Okay. All right. Okay, then we come to replantation resorption. We come into the end, all right? We're coming to the end. This is my favorite. Again, is it replantation, avulsion replantation or intentional? Is it perforated to the pulp or not? Resorption gone to the pulp or not? That's the issue. So you need to think about the pulp being the goal because it's involved, everything else changes. <clears throat> so, so basically you have intentional replantation of hopeless teeth. You have autotransplantation, a vulse or extra articulated replantation. You have uh, aesthetic. So basically why we save them, why we, why we do provisional replantation? You know, I'm, I still do it, okay? You know, second molar surgery sometimes is very difficult. You could do replantation. I'm gonna show you some cases. Aesthetics until the implant can be placed. Biologic prevent alveolar bone. So you preserve the bone socket. Clinical maintain space and function and therapeutic you remove pathology. Okay, so you already gone through. These are my actual slide cases, some of my patients. You can see now, this is the, the problem are these granulation tissue impaction. So it's a fusion of the alveolar bone, okay, with the damaged cementum. And there's no more, you know, it goes right to the dentin. Okay, so this is what we're talking about. All of these teeth have been replanted. Okay, so you see this resorption here, here. See this resorption right here? It did not perforate yet. This is the key element. These are replanted teeth. And we get the replantation resorption. And then these eventually resorb, and that's what we got after seven years. So the prognosis four to seven years. Most of your trauma cases, children in high school. So Indo, Indo can do a, a lot of help for these patients till they become an age where you get an implant. <clears throat> All right, before and then beginning resorption. Look at that, here it's gone, see? Now, 
standard of care, according to Aburaz, the faster that root canal is done, the better. We all know that. Well, we have done a lot of work, and I'm still doing it, in which we do the root canal extra oral. We do it outside before we put the tooth back. So factors to be considered, delayed replantation, no good. You have dehydration of periodontal ligament and cementum. Long splinting period is no good. Delayed endodontic treatment is no good. Substandard endodontic treatment is no good. Damage to the periodontal cementum, that is no good. You do not want to curate the socket from the periodontal ligament. You do not want to hurt the cementum and the periodontal ligament. You know these things. All right, but let me go through some cases. All right, here we go. The problem in the past, and maybe still now in some area, splinting too much. The splinting should be done no more than two to three weeks. They used to keep them for a long time. And unbelievable, some people believed in rejuvenation like they're doing today. They think the pulp could come back and live again. I, I can't believe this crazy things about rejuvenation and uh, regeneration, endodontic regeneration. <clears throat> Al Frank, God rest his soul. The Al Frank technique for apexification was done in 1965. Calcium hydroxide at the apex and you will get regeneration of the apex, okay? Of course, when you have an open apex, when you have a young pulp, you could do anything you want. The key test is on adult teeth, okay? That's the test. And basically the same thing we're talking about replantation here. We're talking about long period. They were hoping for the pulp to come back. Unbelievable. And then you could see, and the donic was done six months, eight months later, you have this, and then you see that. You can see here, it's already perforated. This is why the prognosis is no good. So you wanna do the root before it perforate, the replantation resorption, okay? Look at this one here. And then you can see now how the lesion healed. It healed, and look at the resorption, continue, all right? So endodontic treatment, not gonna stop it, but it's gonna delay it. That's the key. See, here it is, here it is, here it is, and finished. And here it is coming back, that's the terminal after six, seven years. And then we had to remove it. So now we come to the international replantation. These are some of the cases we did. I did at USC and I did in my office. Okay, this is a dental student actually. And they had a perforation. We extracted the tooth. We got the perforation. Look, basically gauze, holding it was gauze, wet gauze, continuous, very gentle extraction. You don't want to traumatize. The, and then we, we did epicoectomy, place some retrofill. I put some retrofill in here where the perforation was and the furcation by hand. Took eight minutes, eight minutes, seven minutes, finish. And here it is done. This is before and this is after. It lasted about four or five years. I don't know what happened to it later but we followed this patient, this student for four years. Then we talk about autotrack. This is one of my cases, my favorite case, which I did it just about before I leave the country. This is a patient came to me, said, please, I do not want to lose this tooth. Please see, you could, I don't want implant. This is the time implant was beginning. I don't want to implant, I want to save my tooth. So I said, it's hopeless, it's gone. So I removed the, Brown, I removed the post, I removed this silver here, and I basically took a burr right up there and I drained this. This is a hopeless tooth. It's gone. Okay, nothing. 
And when I was looking at her, I saw this bicuspid down below, this bicuspid sitting right there, okay? So I said to her, okay, I could take that bicuspid and put it up there for you. She said, anything you want to do, Dr. Aburas. So we extracted the bicuspid from the bottom, okay? And we put it up. And basically what we did, we did root canal on it in hand. You can see now I went from the apex. You can see my canal enlargement here. This is the cervical zone. And this is all the way up to the pulp chamber by hand, AH26, and got a percha and closed it and did epico and we put it back. Remove this, all this pathology now got better. And here it is back, insert it back and look at it. I followed it about six, eight months. Okay, then I, almost a year actually. And she kept it, I don't know exactly where we are on it because I left the city on that. So this is now intentional replantation. Excellent modality. Grossman talked about it many years ago. Excellent modality if you, and now with the technology we have, with the rotary instruments, you know, with the sealers you have, you could do this in five minutes. And our time, basically, you have to be absolutely prepared and you go, 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 go. And that. The only thing I want you to do before you put the tooth back, take your high volume suction and remove the blood clot. Okay. Don't remove the tissue. If you have granulation tissue, you could remove, but don't scrape the walls of the socket, essentially. And then Basically, the last one, and then I'm finished, is the systemic root resorption. This is basically, you have no dental problem. These are strictly case reports. I have not much seen them. I have not treated any of these patients. My students brought me cases, but they were hospital cases. Basically, case reports, okay? And they look into multiple teeth, usually bilateral. Okay, so they're not dental. The key element is this. There is no history of any problem in dental. There's no history of endo or perio or resto. And they have resorption. Okay, so the literature says basically it's systemic diseases and basically hormonal diseases. And you have them available in the literature. This is what you see there, okay? In my, I just added it so you understand there is that, I call this manifestation, manifestation of uh, that, all right? So, and here is a case where unfortunately, the dentist who did this, uh, he told the patient, you have systemic problem. Look at that, it's, this is basically continuous use of intermaxillary elastic bands or constant change in planning and length of the treatment have been associated with multiple and severe root resorption without any signs of systemic. So basically you get this resorption here, orthodontic resorption. This is the aggressive, no good aggressive endodontic and they blame systemic diseases for it, okay? So let me thank you and summarize very quickly. You have six types of endodontic resorption. You have three types of orthodontic resorption. You have four types of periodontal resorption. You have two types of oral pathology resorption. You have two types of replantation resorption. And therefore, in my opinion, you have a total of 16 types, potential, potential resorption in dentistry much more than what you, and I, I don't know about you, but that what I learned in my school. Thank you for listening. And I am ready for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Alvarez. Thank you very much. I congratulate the AU for this great classification of this great clinical case. Uh, people uh, like you make life easier for us with these guides and protocols to be able to classify root reabsorption more easily. 
It is very interesting, really, the experience and with some wisdom uh, of uh, your years of experience are very important in the professional academy. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you. For your time and um, for your teachings, Dr. Abras, really an honor to be with uh, us uh, today. Um, on behalf of the Santo Tomas University, and I'm sure to the NOVA University, I want to say uh, thank you for uh, being here uh, with us today. I am sure the new generations of futures endodontics who are among uh, us uh, today will enjoy and learn a lot from you. Um, experience uh, like uh, today, with you enrich our academics and professional life. Uh, hopefully uh, we can share more of this space because they are very, very important for the training of our students and um, for us like teachers. Uh, doctor, um, we are the uh, all uh, people, the Nova University, Santo Tomas, Bogota, Bucaramanga, um, uh, and we are um, to, uh, to, to give you, uh, thank you. Um, Joana, eh, por fi, por fa, tú puedes eh, saber si hay preguntas abajo o Catalina, tú tienes preguntas en tu universidad o Sandrita, tú eres de Bucaramanga. Uh, Dr. Aburaz, uh, I, I want to just say thank you uh, for, for taking your, your precious time and, and, and spending this uh, afternoon with, or morning, early morning, early afternoon with us. Um, you know, I, I can say from my own experience, you know, uh, having the ability to, to hear you speak is, is a great honor. You know, your, 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 uh, your stress pulp theory was an explanation I would give to so many patients throughout my, my uh, clinical career. Thank you. Uh, you know, every time a crown was prepped and then, and then uh, acts up. But, but uh, you know, uh, to, to have your, your systematic way of explaining resorption, uh, it really, uh, it means a lot in terms of uh, clarifying the various presentations and, and you know, uh, understanding the, the, the biology and then understanding what's actually happening is so important and crucial for all of us. Thank so, you. so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Yes. Dr. Aburaz, thank you so much. Really, I appreciate a lot. And Patricia. Sure. Thank you so much for your invitation. I have a question. In my opinion, I think there is a missing link here about genetics, more research, because I think we have a lot of patients like doing the same procedure, you know, and why are some of them prone to have this kind of entity? And there are so many that really doesn't Yes, like ortho, for example, or cervical resorption, or even invasive. So what do you think about that? What do you think about is miss in research? So what's, what, what, what's the missing link is really the question. And then, and then I'll, I'll follow up with, what's your, in, in your experience, what is your recommendation in terms of utilizing trichloroacetic acid in the treatment of some of these resorptive defects? Okay, uh, I have to tell you, I am 100% believer in cause and effect. I don't believe the only resorption that I believe may have to do with aging, aging, okay, is the 80, 90 years old man which I had some cases which they had external resorption. And this research, which I mentioned to you at the UCLA, they found that they called it the accidental resorption. They found it mostly in older people, all right? So aging, okay, function, usage of teeth, now we're keeping teeth longer than ever before. Maybe that's a factor in addition to the issue of genetic. 
but the resorption that we see in your clinic every day, the patient see in our business today, they all caused by substandard care, iatrogenic care, inferior care, could be bad endo, bad perio, bad ortho, bad resto. That's in my, my opinion. I found there is, it's not associated relationship, it's causal. When you do this, you do that. When you do this, you get that. Now, let me get back to the issue of, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Patricia had a presentation on the issue and throughout history, okay, they use calcium hydroxide in the treatment of external root resorption, okay? These, I mean, this is great. Everything has been tried, all right? Calcium hydroxide been used for everything, including whatever. But essentially, essentially, these therapeutic, after you leave them on site in 10, 15 minutes, they've been neutralized and they become useless, whether they are inside or outside in two days, three days, four days. What we are talking about is, it is a problem that needs to be resolved by removing the osteoclastic activity. You need to remove the clastic cells. You need to remove the bacteria. You need to remove the dead tissue. So the answer is not medicinal, it is surgical. I am sorry to this philosophy, and I don't think I can change because I have 40 years experience in it. I've tried medications. So essentially, in my opinion, with the laser today, early detection, that's what we need to work on. Get the cervical, become cervical. Get it when it's only on the buckle before it's spread to the interproximal. And this is what we need. You know, dentists don't do probing. They're not using really the techniques that comprehensive examination. This is why we developed the 4R operational diagnosis. So in my opinion, you know, you're asking a question about the medications, you know, uh, unfortunately, when I reviewed the literature in Perio, we found most of the problem is when those dentists used to do conditioning of the root structure, uh, you know, acidic acid, tetracycline, and all of that in order to have a better attachment, caused resorption. So, so that's that's the uh, the point. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that gives you a point for the doctors to go ahead and search it. <laughs> and one last one thing, last thing because we didn't talk about it, the invasive cervical resorption situation. Yeah. yeah. How do you, in your opinion, when it's already a hither say class three or four, but it's a vital and asymptomatic case, are you a proponent of monitoring those or a proponent of addressing them? No, no monitoring, act. 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 Yes, act, okay. and instead I lay a flap, take a look, see what's happening, please. Okay, you thank know, you. Uh, let, let, me, let me just take uh, one minute here. Indo is not an operative procedure. Indo is not a restorative procedure. Indo is a surgical procedure. When you remove that pulp, you're removing pulp tissue, surgery that means you need the this the the whole thing is surgical so what does that mean infected tissue inflamed tissue must be removed not medicated so i have this idea of me you know it's the same thing i told you the four hour operational diagnosis to me an anesthetized patient Lay a small flap, take a look. And you may find that the cervical resorption only on the buckle. Great. Remove, do crown lengthening. I've done a lot of crown lengthening on resorption cases. And all of a sudden, the resorption becomes like a class five restoration. Composite finished. 
the wait and see, the watch, watching is not a good game, okay? Many times uh, the, the knife is faster than the bottle of medication. I'm sorry, it's a philosophy. <laughs> Doctor, what do you think about after you remove this tissue, you have you feeling uh, this uh, reabsorption, reabsorption with the biodentin. I'm sorry, what's the last thing? Do biopsy? Do, yes. do biopsy? Uh, yeah, you can, yeah, yeah. 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 There's a space with the biodentin. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, yes. Fine. Fine. If you're going to use it uh, as a filling material, uh, no problem. They've been tried. They've been tried. But again, you know, I read all of this literature, and then it says no significant difference between this and that. Then I go back to my technique. That's, that's basically what it is. And this is why I'm sorry, but uh, I mean, this is a, Patricia, I want you to hear me. You're going to hear a bias. You're not going to hear somebody, uh, your philosophy 100%. I developed my own view, my own vision for things. I tried. You know, remember, I'm a student of traditional Indo. And then 20, 30 years at USC with my graduate students, Sergio, one of them, we changed. We changed the face of endodontics in California. Okay. And right now, I don't know what it is, but basically, we are more straightforward, more direct. We want it done. We want action. We want a result. Uh, you know, that's, that's just, just a philosophy. Okay. Okay. In Bogotá, no more questions, doctor. I don't Para know. También estamos bien acá. Gracias. Okay. <laughs> okay, so basically I have, uh, you know, I'm uh, a lot of, I get a lot of questions online and different people on Twitter and, and you know, they ask me questions. So sometimes I do videos answering questions. So uh, I send some of them to Patricia and uh, you got my email, you could send Oscar, we could send you our philosophy more and more in different, different areas of uh, non-surgical and surgical endodontics. Okay, we're glad to collaborate. And we have also a YouTube channel, I guess. I don't follow it, somebody else does. I just produce the material. Okay, enjoy, enjoy. thank you for the translators. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm really sorry that I had to go a little bit fast. And uh, I thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, doctors, for attending. And I hope to see you sometime in the future. Thank you. Doctor, muchas gracias a todos. Cata, mil gracias. Sandrita Huitrago, muchas gracias a los estudiantes de la Universidad de Nova, al doctor Benjamin, muchas gracias por su participación, a todos mis estudiantes eh, y a todos los de Bucaramanga, doctor, y especialmente a usted. Eh, muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Eh, love you. Thank you. Ok. Bye, Colombia. Bye, Riyadh. <laughs> bye, bye.